Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. This is the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. Now, we are back after a month-long hiatus, and today we are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet. I, along with my co-host, Ian McCormack, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Today, we bring you the letter L, which stands for Leadership in an Emergency. Later in the episode, we'll be speaking with a mayor from Alberta who was on the front lines of the most recent Alberta wildfires. We will first, though, talk about a vote from a small municipality in Ontario who decided against raising any flags besides governmental ones on governmental properties. We will then be talking about a village in the Northwest Territories, and we will be then ending in New Brunswick talking about the provincial government's recently introduced Bill 45. But first, as always, Ian, long time no see. How are you? It does feel like it's been a while, Chris. I'm doing pretty well. I'm really, I was saying to you just uh, before this, of course, it's really, I'm chomping at the bit to get going with this. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited as well. And uh, we have so many things that we want to talk about, but first let's go to Ontario uh, where a township of Norwich, Ontario in April voted to exclude pride flags and not all other non-civic flags from being flown on its properties. Instead, the municipality moved to only fly flags representing municipal, provincial, and federal governments. The bylaw was proposed by one of the local councillors who he says believes that civic flags best represent all groups of people and allow everyone to coexist in harmony regardless of their identity or beliefs. Now, after the vote, Ward 2 Councillor Alicia Stubbs announced her immediate resignation after the final vote in protest of the council's decision to support the bylaw. Now, Ian, this has become a PR nightmare for the township of Norwich. With it being in the headlines for some time right now before Pride Month and as we are in Pride Month, how should municipalities handle issues around social conscience? Wow. Uh, well, it's not like there's a right or a wrong. Where you stand depends on where you sit in a case like this. In reality, and the articles have pointed this out as well, the decision to allow only essentially municipal flags on municipal flagpoles is one that is couched in terms of uh, equity, treating everybody exactly the same and not wanting to pick out any, quote, <clears throat> special interest groups. The reality of it, of course, is that if somebody had come with a flag for I don't know, the curling club or scouts or breast cancer. Chances are it may well have been considered quite well, but the fact that this is something that's an issue that has shown up all over the country and probably around the world is something that is sometimes divisive. That's where it come, the push comes to shove. And in reality, this is something that 99% of municipalities and other organizations across this country seem to have no problem with about suggesting that. I am waiting for this counselor maybe to say, well, maybe we need a straight Pride Month or flag or something, but that hopefully is not on the not going to come. To me, municipalities, whatever their size, are made up of small C communities anyway. So they are communities of interest or faith or employment or government or whatever the case may be. And the, the local government wouldn't exist without those other communities being in place anyway. So the fact we choose to celebrate one of those communities at a time, 52 of them throughout the year, I think really adds some richness to the uh, to the municipal Amelia here in uh, in this particular location, but right across the country as well. So this is something which is, you mentioned it was a bit of a PR night nightmare. I completely agree with you on that, that it's some people who may be somewhat regressive, if you like, that are, are doing things that probably a lot of people looking at them from the outside and saying it's much to do about nothing, just get with the program and get with it, what everybody else is up to as well. I just, it's now what they've done is created a no-win situation for themselves. Now, some of the surrounding communities around the township did come out in support of the uh, flying the pride flag, Oxford County Warden Marcus Ryan, uh, the city of London's deputy mayor. Uh, I, I'm going to pronounce his, I, I forget his name right now. I apologize, deputy mayor. Um, but they've come out and said, this is, like you said, regressive. Is it hard when you're dealing with a smaller community that is surrounded by so many 
organizations and municipalities who are going one way and you're bucking the trend in some <laughs> sense and going a different way? I'm sure it's hard. Uh, municipal councils are elected from within, of course, and the people who happen to live there, they get more votes than anybody else. But other than that, the people who populate the councils are no different than anywhere else. Uh, the London deputy mayor, a fellow by the name of John Lewis, said that this was the first time he had ever written to another municipality about a particular issue. So they are, of course, catching some of this from other places as well. So they will get hoisted in their own petard at some point. There are people of the uh, township may take exception to this at the next election, which in Ontario is coming up, I suppose, two and a half years away still. But it's uh, it's something that we're running into, but less and less fortunately. So when you deal with municipal councillors in your role at Strategic Steps, what do you tell councillors and mayors to do when they have an issue of social conscience or even something that they believe is right, but the the majority of people that they hear from want another way? They don't want you to vote for a bylaw. Because there it sounds like from some of the articles that I had read, not the one that I had sent you, but some that I had read, that it seemed like the vocal majority were in favor of only allowing governmental flags to fly at the governmental buildings. Mm -hmm. So one thing, one way I have heard of this deal go with quite commonly is by saying, you know what, we have three flags out front of our town office. That's the provincial flag, our town flag, and the national flag. So why don't we put up a fourth flagpole that celebrates something, right? It could be a community flagpole. We've also seen flags now added for um, Métis, a Métis flag or a treaty flag or a confederation flag and those sorts of things that are popping up as well. So more and more of this is happening. The way we deal with it, I think, matters too. Um, again, the people who get elected into these offices are representative of the community. If I'd rather know what people actually think and be able to work with that than have them hide behind a pride flag, say. So this is something that uh, local groups within the uh, within the region probably can certainly uh, take and deal with 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 council and with administration who may think completely differently than council does. The Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs has determined that it has become necessary to place the hamlet of Fort Resolution in the Northwest Territories under administration due to the financial and operational challenges it has been facing. Ian, as someone who has been on the side of giving municipal inspections, this is a, another step in provincial and territorial uh, mandates that have are able to go into municipalities and place them under administration control, isn't it? It is. And this is, uh, this is showing some of the, in this case, territorial oversight of local government in Canada. We're going to get to provincial oversight in our, our next little bit too, but the territorial oversight here is such that uh, people in Port Resolution in the Northwest Territories have been saying for years that there is some financial, some untoward financial things that seem to have been happening, and council had not been able to get to the bottom of it, essentially. So much like other provinces and territories, the provincial department, in this case, it's called NACA, or the Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs chose to remove council, mayor and council, and instead put in a, an administrator. Uh, and the, the administrator essentially carries all the authority and responsibility of council without a council, without council being present. So things like bylaws and policies. But in reality, what they're looking for in this case is to have a look at the budget, because there hasn't been a budget in a while, to make sure there is a way to recover from a deficit that has been growing and municipalities across the country, for the most part, aren't allowed to run deficits. So an accumulated deficit or accumulated debt becomes problematic. And then uh, coming back with financial audits and financial reports and that sort of thing, and really to bring the hamlet in line with what you would expect from the standards of good governance and certainly with the legislative com uh, compliance as well. After that happens, it's up to the minister to make the determination of whether the municipality is now heading on the right track or not. And if the minister does make that choice, then what would typically happen is uh, an election would be called, there would be off cycle, probably, and a new council would be elected and would take over for maybe the remainder of whatever term is left, or if it's a new term for the full term, and would pick up after where the, uh, the administrator has, has left off. 
And sometimes there's a transition period in this year too. So this is something that is probably wise oversight of local government um, across the country, but in this case, in the BC. The three municipal organizations in the province of New Brunswick are raising concerns about a bill that would give the Minister of Local Government in the province of New Brunswick, or for those who are listening outside of the province of New Brunswick, the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs for some other provincial governments, the power to amend or repeal municipal bylaws. Bill 45, or the Local Governments Commission Act, is intended to create a new body that will oversee conflicts of interest, the code of conduct complaints, as well as help municipalities reach funding agreements over regional facilities. The three municipal organizations in the province are saying that the bill is an attack on local autonomy. Ian, when the province oversteps and rolls out a bill like Bill 45, what do municipalities have in their arsenal to fight back against a bill like Bill 45? Well, constitutionally, I suspect they probably don't have anything because the constitution gives uh, the oversight of local government to the, to the provinces and territories to manage. But, however, what has happened across the country is that they have uh, provinces and territories have essentially seen local government as a an independent order of government or a different order of government and responsible for different things than the provinces, territories, and feds are responsible for. What this does is it starts to impede. It, it takes provincial authority into the realm of municipal responsibility. And frankly, it scares me quite a lot that this could happen because this is like uh, some of the things we heard potentially in Ontario with changing some of the, the strong mayor powers or bringing some strong mayor powers in. But what's happening here in New Brunswick with uh, essentially giving the province the ability to amend or rescind bylaws, something that they have said is only going to be used judiciously and in cases where it's obvious that it needs to be done. And somebody else said, well, this becomes a bit of a slippery slope. And I think they're completely right that the, the provincial oversight or provincial authority over local governments is there in the constitution, but it's not something that we have seen practiced around the country. And I don't think it's something that is beneficial to the local government. It scares them quite a bit. We've seen this, to me, this is kind of the opposite end to downloading. So what we've seen in downloading is downloading of responsibility without downloading of resources. And what this does is it bookends it a little bit with the possibility that the municipality really can't do anything about it. And that's actually kind of where your question started. And you mentioned the municipal associations. Well, individual municipalities and the municipal associations and the municipal administrators associations and others can certainly push back against the province on this, even though they legally they probably the province is within its authority. But the, the public will or the court of public opinion might be against this as well. And that's probably something that the local governments and the local government associations are going to have to leverage in order to see some changes happen or this not come to pass. So I was recently on the uh, NB Poly podcast show, which is hosted by two St. John's counselors out in New Brunswick. And out uh, after the conversation, we, we had a conversation around Bill 45. And what they sort of alluded to was New Brunswick is usually the testing ground for bills like this. They see if they can pass in a more smaller community, a smaller province, sorry. And then you see other provinces usually picking it up. Uh, they they expect uh, the province of Ontario to potentially bring something in like this. And then in a conversation I had with a rural councillor here in Alberta, they also alluded to the fact that they could see something like this coming to Alberta. So this story, while it is a New Brunswick story, is kind of got getting legs and we could see it not just in the province, like you said, but surprisingly all across Alberta or all across Canada, where provincial governments are going to be rescinding municipal bylaws. And in the bylaw, I should note, it does say that the uh, minister of local government or minister, minister responsible for municipalities will only rescind a bylaw if a resident comes forward and asks for a review of said bylaw. It's not just the minister doing it willy nilly. And that's what the province would say. So I'm just trying to give it context here that sure. it's not the minister coming in and just randomly rescinding it. But do municipalities across Canada, because we're just a few week days after the FCM conference, need to start looking at these provincial bills on a more national stage, because what happens in New Brunswick could potentially happen in BC. 
Sure, uh, that makes sense to me. The, the constitution is the constitution, even though provincial acts are, are territorial acts are different from one another. They are fundamentally similar. And the comment about this law only having certain um, authority in it now is one thing. But if somebody has the temerity to put this through a legislature now, there's nothing to say it can't be amended by the next government or even later in this legislative session to say something that's perhaps a little bit more intrusive. So this could be a bit of a slippery slope. New Brunswick, however, has just gone through a significant amalgamation process as of the last municipal election. And I wonder if while that reduces the number of municipalities, if that does provide a little bit more power or authority to each of those municipalities, because they all now represent more people than they used to as well. So I wonder if that's an alternate mechanism or another mechanism that the local governments might use throughout the problems too. It's going to be a story that I'm assuming you and I will be following quite closely over the next few months as this rolls out. But we will be right back after a quick break with the mayor of the town of Edson in the province of Alberta, Mayor Kevin Sahara. And we'll be talking about leadership in an emergency. We'll be right back. Today, we are honored to have Edson Mayor Kevin Zahara. Kevin, in the last month, has been on the front lines of true leadership embodiment. On Friday, May 5th, Yellowhead County and the town of Edson issued immediate evacuation order due to a wildfire burning out of control near the community. The mayor's updates on social media and steadfast leadership during the wildfires made him a source of knowledge and trusted information for residents and Canadians witnessing the horrors in his communities. Kevin, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, but I want to first start off by asking how life has been since the evacuation order was lifted and residents have returned home after the few days being evacuated. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Chris. I think um, certainly for the first couple of weeks being back, there was a, a certain level of anxiety within the community. Uh, the fire is still burning out of control um, and it was still... Uh, quite active until we got some rain. So there was there was a lot of anxiety, and I think that there still is a little bit uh, in our community that uh, we may have to leave again. Uh, things have gone much better. We got lots of fire breaks, lots of people working on the fire. We've had some rain, and things have greened up. So we're we're positive that we're in a in a good place, and uh, just thankful for all the crews that stepped up and helped our community out. Now, as I said in the introduction, you 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 were quite prominent on social media during the first few days and even during the evacuation, even to today, for you and your role as mayor to your residents, how big of a responsibility in that leadership role did you put on yourself to make sure that the information you were providing to residents was accurate, but you also combated the misinformation that might have been out there via social media? So I think one of the big things is in an emergency like we were faced with, uh, we want to make sure that we got accurate information, as you as you mentioned. Um, there was, uh, leading up to the evacuation, it was quite noticeable in the community that things were changing. Skies were dark. Uh, things were uh, not looking very good. It was windy. Um, but we didn't um, have any concrete information as to needing to evacuate at that point in time early in that afternoon. Things change drastically. Um, so getting the information out in a timely ma manner is really, really important, but also the accurate information. And I'm actually quite thankful that um, we did not evacuate the town a little bit sooner uh, because the original plan was to evacuate to the community of Edmonton. Highway 16 was shut down, which meant all the residents would have had to go up Highway 32. Had we done that, uh, we would have had a situation on our hands because a wildfire broke up on broke out on Highway 32, uh, which ended up closing down that highway just as we were about to issue the evacuation notice. So that's why our community went uh, towards Hinton and Jasper. Um, so throughout the emergency, um, information was changing uh, rapidly because of the weather conditions, uh, because new information was coming to light. So. Um, we really uh, tried to drive home the message, especially uh, following the evacuation, that please listen to official channels for information because there's so many rumors. People start talking and then it becomes fact. When it, in actual fact, it, it, it has no uh, basis in reality. 
Um, and people were pretty good about that once we started getting that message out there when we met with evacuees. Uh, we, myself, uh, as the mayor of Edson, um, I was getting information on the fly as well. Um, so basically, before we met with the evacuees, that's when we got our information. Um, so it was really important that uh, we, we tried to communicate in a timely manner of making sure that information was accurate. You've uh, obviously got a, a key role during a crisis like this, as would the Reeve say. What is the rest of council doing during this time as well? How do they help out? Well, that was the interesting challenge. As I mentioned, uh, information was changing rapidly. So it's really hard to keep council in the loop, especially when you're spread out between three communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we had, we had people that were in Hinton, we had people that were in Jasper. Um, so we tried to keep them updated as much as possible. And I think the key role for them was they were uh, around a lot of evacuees. So uh, making sure they had the correct information and that they could clarify any misinformation that might be out there. Um, myself and the mayor of the county, uh, we were, um, you know, traveling between communities, uh, evacuation centers, um, and not everybody has social media and not everybody was attending these meetings. So uh, I think councillors had a really important role in uh, making sure people had accurate information and also just being visible, seeing that, okay, there's leadership in the community uh, in Hinton and in Jasper and in other places um, and just being that conduit of information. Uh, really an emergency situation, it's, it's the mayors that are, are responsible for communicating. Um, and I think one of the things for the general public to realize is the mayors are not the ones making the decisions. It is the emergency responders and those that are equipped with that knowledge making those decisions. The mayor of Edson did not evacuate the, the town of Edson. It was a, 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 that call was made by a group of people that certainly know a lot more than I do about emergency management and have the information to make that call. The only thing that the, the mayor of Edson did was issue the state of local emergency, giving them that power to make those decisions. Did you see any sort of an impact on the either the fire or the evacuation or both on your municipal team, your you, your colleagues on council and your municipal staff? What's the impact been on them? Um, so our, our, our town of Edson employees were phenomenal. And, you know, I'm going to say that Yellow County as well. I, I can't speak for Yellow County, uh, but they've been dealing with this emergency for over a month. So they're tired. They're really, really tired. Uh, town of Edson staff, uh, it was stressful. They have families that they had to worry about as well, but they were answering phones in the, in the ECC 24 hours a day and they were uh, at the evacuation center. And so, um, you know, we, we certainly want to make sure our employees are taken care of. And uh, I can't say enough, the, 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 the team at the town of Edson really stepped up and uh, I'm incredibly proud of them uh, for all the work they've done. Uh, you know, people, come up to me and say, Mayor, great job. I had very little to do. I was the communicator. Um, obviously, you know, a lot weighted on my shoulders, but the people actually doing the work on the front lines, those are our staff and our volunteer firefighters and and all those, there's contractors out there that were helping out. So uh, just a huge shout out to them. You as mayor have had to deal with a few emergencies over the last few years, COVID-19, now the Alberta wildfires. I can imagine this is not what you want, signed up for when you decided to run for mayor of your community. What have you learned about yourself in this role as mayor to make you feel like you've become a better leader in these emergency situations? Because unfortunately, I'm going to say this, and I don't want to say it out loud, but I'm going to, wildfires are going to continue to happen. People are going to have to get evacuated. So what did you learn about yourself that you hope other mayors who are listening to this, other councillors who might be listening to this, might think to themselves, if this is the advice that Kevin's giving me, I'm going to take it and run with it. I think being true to yourself, but but being calm in an emergency is, is a key role. Like people who are looking to their, their, their community leaders uh, and to provide accurate information. Don't answer questions you don't, you don't know the answers to. Uh, and don't make suggestions if you don't know uh, what's going to happen. Uh, these are fluid situations. Uh, working with your, your senior administration, uh, your directors of emergency management. Uh, for myself, I think what I've learned about myself is that uh, um, I can develop much thicker skin now. Uh, there's things that just don't bother me as much as probably when I, when I got into this role. And understanding the importance of, of the job you're trying to do. Uh, and understanding people may not be happy with those decisions, but that's okay. 
Um, don't make decisions based on the next election. Make, make decisions based on what's good for the overall health and safety of your community. Um, you know, historians will look back at COVID-19 and, and make their own judgment calls on what was right, what was wrong. Um, I've always taken the approach. I'm working with the information I have at the time. And uh, if people want to, to uh, um, criticize or uh, uh, hold me accountable for that, that's totally fine. That's what I signed up for. Jump in at the moment. You and Chris had a bit of a chat earlier about information and disinformation, misinformation. Now looking back on this, do you think, well, presumably the uh, the town and the county were providing useful, timely, correct information to people who needed it. Do you think that has an impact on where people will start to get information from or whether it will change their opinions of reliable sources of information? I think uh, more people are now more aware of um, the information that is provided by the municipalities. Uh, certainly, I think the thing that, that really worked well for us is we set up a, a time each day that we were going to talk directly to our residents. No information, no major update was going to happen about our communities until we talked to the people in person and gave them the opportunity to ask any questions that they may have. Um, you know, I give a, a huge shout out to our CAOs, uh, Christine Beveridge and Luke Mercier over at the county. Uh, for the work that they did. Um, they're not in charge of the emergency either. They are, uh, they're the CAOs in the municipality. The director of emergency management is, is responsible for uh, the emergencies for, for the town of Edson was Bob Beck and Albert Berry for the county. And they did a fantastic job. Um, but I think one of the things I'm proud of is we did those um, updates in person and we made sure that media wasn't in the room because some of this stuff is, is quite sensitive in terms of people's property, their lives. Um, and, and the media was very responsive to that. Uh, they understood that, you know, things may be asked or, or questions that they may not be comfortable asking in front of a camera or the media. So uh, there was a public portion and then there was a, a closed portion for uh, the residents themselves. So that was, uh, I think, some really good, good information there. Sorry, I want to jump in on that because you mentioned the media. Did you see the role of the media as uh, as a as a source of sort of trusted information you can get out there? Because I can imagine we as I used to work for a municipality in northern Alberta and there have been numerous fires in the area that the moment something like this happens, your phone rings off the hook. Your social medias are flooded with interview requests. How do you get the information out there while using the traditional media, quote unquote, traditional media, because not everyone has Facebook, not everyone has Twitter, not everyone has LinkedIn. So you have to use them, but you can't just willy nilly give them all the information that they need, because like you said, you have to go to the people first. So as the mayor, as the leader, what role did you see the media playing in the emergency during your this recent wildfire? Well, being a rural municipality, um, you know, it's challenging because there's so much information that you need to get out there and, and you know, the, the news networks are only going to use a 10 second clip. So um, I'll be quite frank, it's, it's not really valuable, I don't think, for the local residents necessarily to get the information they need in terms of what, uh, what's going on. And unfortunately, we've seen uh, over the years uh, less local media, less local radio stations, less newspapers. Um, so it's really trying to get that information out directly through the municipal social channels, the websites, and directly to residents. I seen the media, um, and, and we didn't, if we had nothing new to say, we did, like I didn't respond to a lot of media calls. Um, but once I had information that I thought was valuable, uh, then we started arranging interviews. And it's really to get information out to the, to the larger community. Um, and to the province about what's going on in your, your area. So you're not, so they know what's happening within the Edson region. So it's not forgotten about. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we have in the town of Edson is uh, our evacuees were less than seven days. So they only were out of their homes for three days, but there's expenses that have, um, they've incurred. And some of these folks don't have a lot of resources. That's whether or not they get food on their table, right? Or uh, they may not have money for gas in their vehicles. And that was one of the big concerns if we had to evacuate again. And unfortunately, government programs up until this point are not helping. Uh, insurance deductibles are really high. And the Red Cross hasn't been very helpful either, to be frank. So, um, you know, getting that information, making sure people are aware that we need to improve these programs for individuals. 
Uh, not saying that they need twelve hundred dollars, but you know, uh, with receipts, I think that on a daily basis, people should be able to be reimbursed uh, through a government program, and that's something that we'll be lobbying for moving forward. My last question to you, uh, Kevin, is actually kind of related to that: is when we heard certainly more more uh, tragedy coming from places like um, more from uh, Fort Buffalo or from Slave Lake. We were lessons that we learned from that. We were able to incorporate it in other places too. If uh, towns like Edson or Rocky, uh, the Raken Valley, those kind of places, then uh, are there things that we can learn to implement in future fire seasons that might make things a little bit easier to? Yeah, I think, you know, you look at the Slave Lake Wildfire Report, there was a huge amount of information that I think is beneficial. And unfortunately, over the years, we've seen budgets cut. And there, there's reasons for that. Um, uh, I think first and foremost, climate change is here, whether you believe in it or not. Um, and we're seeing more active wildfires. We're seeing bigger wildfires. And we need to make sure that we have the resources in place. And look at forested communities and what we can do to mitigate it. We have fire smart programs, but that's not enough anymore. Um, you know, um, and looking at ways that we can hopefully uh, improve the safety of our communities, but also I think educating our public to be more prepared, uh, especially in the forester communities. I think now that we've gone through this here in Edson, I think all residents are more prepared. I'm thankful that we are a pretty big uh, RVing community. So a lot of people just hooked up their RVs and left, but they had no water in their tanks. They were still winterized, um, but companies stepped up and helped out with that. Um, understanding uh, the dangers uh, of wildfires in our communities. Southern Alberta, a lot more to do with, uh, you know, grass fires or floods, um, but we got to be prepared for that. And I hope that all levels of government look at that. Uh, it's interesting to note that the town of Edson itself um, did not have a fire protection uh, structural unit in our fire department. And that was in our budget this year because we knew that wildfire risk was uh, ever really increasing. So we had that in our budget this year. Unfortunately, the fire happened before we could get it. So uh, we're going to be more prepared as a municipality as well. Uh, one of the discussions our council had is, well, you know, we can look at other communities and use theirs in, in case of a wildfire. Well, guess what? This, this is the case in point. All those units were deployed elsewhere. So we need to protect ourselves. Evan, I, I want to thank, take this moment and thank uh, you from Ian and myself for sitting down and doing this. Um, your leadership during the Alberta wildfires is one that people should look at and potentially write a book about in future days. But um, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're getting ready to head into a council meeting, but uh, thank you so much for taking this time and chatting with us today. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, what happened here in Edison and our thoughts and prayers are with all the other communities in Northern Alberta that are still dealing with a very, very uh, dangerous and unfortunate situation. So yeah. our full interview with Kevin will be airing next Wednesday, but right now we'll be right back after a quick commercial break. Well, Ian, after a month, we are back. And if I do say so myself, another great episode of The Political Trenches, local government at work. Yeah, uh, listening to uh, Mayor Zahara here, it really gives me a, an idea about how people are tested in a crisis and who who excels and who doesn't. And it uh, seemed to me that Edson kind of did as well as they possibly could under the difficult circumstances they were they were faced with. So it's really good to hear. It, it certainly was. And he gave us a unique uh, sort of semi peek behind the curtains of what yeah. goes on, because as he even said, um, while the mayor is the face of the community during an emergency, he's not the one that's ultimately making the decisions. And it's uh, high time that we remember that when people are yelling at our elected officials sometimes. You know, one of the things I didn't get a chance to ask the mayor that would have been really interesting was council the deliberative process is back and forth. But when you get into a crisis like this, it changes to command and control and if by necessity and how well a, a council adapts to that change. And that would have been something interesting to next time. Hopefully there isn't a next time, however. <laughs> Um, but also, before we wrap officially wrap up, uh, last month, uh, well, I should say almost a month and a half ago, uh, we had held the Bucking the Trend Conference in Edmonton. I was there. I think it was a rousing success. I am assuming you enjoyed yourself as well. 
Well, yeah, we did. We did a debrief afterwards, of course, and we uh, were glad, really glad we did it. And now we're starting to think about, well, what do we, what comes next? We didn't want this just to be a one-off and uh, we'll see whatever sun off or do it someplace else or something to that effect. Um, but I want to take a moment and thank you all for listening to the show and watching the show via YouTube. If you can leave us a comment, give us a star rating on Apple podcast or Spotify. It will help us reach more municipal fans like yourself. We will be back in two weeks time with the letter M, which will be standing for the Maritimes. As always, Ian, it's been a pleasure. Indeed it has. Talk to you soon.